I'm Howard Teach, founding chair of Manhattan Jewish Historical Initiative. We welcome, we welcome you to our fifth MJHI Manhattan Jewish Hall of Fame evening inducting 10 new members, the class of 23, and reaching a historic milestone of sorts as we now will pass the threshold of 50 Hall of Famers in our five classes, a most extraordinary group of Manhattanites. Before I say anything, I, I see Gail Brewer sitting here, now our councilman, and before that our borough president, and, and also Mark Levine is here, our borough president. We got to thank them as well as Scott Stringer. It's their administrations that have provided the rooms for us for every one of our meetings. And that's unbelievable. And they've been so supportive that I just want to have a real round of applause for what they did. Yeah, At this time, I would ask you to all rise as I introduce a very talented, much in demand trumpeter who we admire, Eganem Segbefia, who will play a rendition of God Bless America by Irving Berlin, and then we'll be back for a few more, re I'll be back for a few more remarks. Well,
thanks. She'll get brief segments from a lot of people who are used to speaking for much late, longer, great lengths of time. So here goes. MJI, which is, was a thought only a few years ago, to recognize and record one of the greatest civilizations in the 5,000 year history of our Jewish people, New York City, and particularly here in Manhattan, Manhattan's Jewish history and people. A word about the process that we use for selecting Hall of Fame inductees, so you should know. You will note that it represents a leadership cross-section of our community, and that is purposeful. We go through a very specific, deliberative effort to have the best of the best from different fields and accomplishments. And you will hear that in the five minute, actually four and a half minute, <laughs> conversations that will follow. We would look forward to all of your future involvement in what we're doing, being supportive and being involved. And let me now introduce a man who needs no introduction. There is only one Rabbi Joe, and he has been such a great supporter of MJHI from day one, even offering up the New York Board of Rabbis as the fiscal conduit for our funds. As co-host for the evening, the Executive Vice President of the New York Board of Rabbis, Rabbi Joseph Potasnik. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the night when Jews in Manhattan ask one question. Why did he get an award and I didn't? And we'll try to answer that for you this evening. Dr. Ruth, I just want to say what an honor it is to be with you. Any question that Dr. Ruth cannot answer, please see me after the program tonight. Also, I want to nominate someone for next year's Manhattan Jewish Hall of Fame. He hasn't been able to get in all these years. Howard Teach. All right, let's get him in next year. He looks much better here than he does up there, so let's, let's get him into that Hall of Fame. Uh, let me also say one other thing. I went to Yeshiva University. Rabbi Miller, you were there as well. Much older. Uh, I remember the librarian of the yeshiva came over to me one day, he says, you won't believe this. There was a student of yeshiva years ago who died, who in his will bequeathed his library to Yeshiva University. True story. We were thrilled. We went over to the house to get the books. And then we found these were the books that were taken out of Yeshiva University's library and never returned over the years. So on behalf of Tony Marks, the head of the library, those of you who've taken out books, please return them. We're gonna do the same thing in the synagogues. Those of you walked away with yarmulkes, over the years. Bring them back, all right? We're gonna have a buyback program. Finally, I wanna to say to all of you very seriously, you're gonna meet a lot of interesting people tonight and hear their biographies and hear about their backgrounds. As you look around this park, you see all of these branches. There is a blessing that says, may the branches be as strong as the roots. We have all these branches. You're gonna hear about their roots as well. Let's stay strong together. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to introduce someone who, uh, when he was growing up, his mother would always say to him, Mark, in America, you can grow up and become the president. And he followed her advice. He became the president of the borough of Manhattan, the Honorable Mark Levine. If you want to hear more from Rabbi Joe, who'll be appearing at the Comedy Cellar next Tuesday, and yes, he's available for weddings and bar mitzvahs. I'm not going to play the straight man. Um, I am so honored to be part of this ceremony. Howard, you have built something truly precious and important to the Jewish community of Manhattan and beyond. Can we give the future Hall of Fame member, Howard Teach, a big round of applause? You know, this little tiny island of Manhattan plays such a massively outsized role in Jewish history. Uh, Honestly, even just the Lower East Side itself uh, has in many ways impacted the trajectory of Jewish life in America, of America. Ever, anyone ever hear of bagels? And there are so many giants who have emerged uh, off this island. Bella Abzug, Stephen Sondheim, Scarlett Johansson, uh, all emerged out of the Jewish communities of this borough. Uh, some of the most storied synagogues in America right here in this borough. 
some of the most storied institutions, social service institutions, right here in this borough. Welcome to my friend, our comptroller, Brad Lander. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, there was a hospital here called Jews Hospital, now known as Mount Sinai. So many of the great institutions of this borough have their roots in the Jewish community. And it's a story that's still unfolding. We're still writing this story. In so many ways, there's a renaissance of Jewish life in America. Did you know that the Syrian Jewish community on the Upper East Side is booming and growing? And there's stories like that in neighborhoods all over the borough. And there are leaders like those we're honoring tonight that are helping to write that history. I looked at this lineup. I could talk about almost every one of these people, and I won't. But I can't not mention um, a few folks who are here with us right now. Um, Dick Gottfried, who uh, in many ways has defined for me what it means to be a thoughtful, impactful, principled, serious elected official. Thank you, Dick, for what you have done for this city, what you've done for health policy. Um, sitting next to him, I didn't uh, acknowledge her earlier, but oh my goodness, Gail Brewer, amazing. The one, the only. Uh, continues to be an amazing partner for me. I um, Okay. She wants you to wants me to say that I said to her that she is my friend and that I love her. Thank you. Everyone concur in English and Hebrew. Um, and, and, and finally, Deborah, there's no reason you would remember this, but in 2016, we went out campaigning together uh, on the Upper West Side at a senior center. And it was amazing until we were accosted by a few Trump supporters. And you handled it with such grace. You didn't lose your cool. You convinced everybody in the room. Um, I have such admiration for you because of that moment and what you've continued to do to stand up for the Jewish community and our values in politics and beyond. So thank you. Thank you, Howard, for honoring this incredible woman. And that's it for me. Um, thank you all so much for this beautiful night. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Nice to hear about the growth of Manhattan. Can we get a few more smoke shops uh, as well this coming year? have a little more growth. Someone asked me about Gail Brewer the other day. And I said, Gail Brewer, Brewer is a Jew. For this reason, a Christian in New York is a Jew. A Jew in Idaho is a Christian. Gail Brewer is everywhere. There isn't a program I've ever attended without the presence of Gail Brewer. She and Mark and other elected officials here, I would identify as communitarians. They are there for the community. It's a great honor to welcome not only a council person from the West Side, but everyone's council person, Gail Brewer. Thank you, Rabbi. I cannot keep up with your Saturday Night Live jokes. But I do have one, which was frightening at the time. I was in Brooklyn. I never go to Brooklyn. I was in Brooklyn, and my friend Rabbi Heck was presenting. Now, he has his uh, senior center in Brooklyn. He lives in Queens, and he's always in Manhattan. I'm always at UJA, and he's always there. And so it's, it was years ago. Actually, I think it was like 20 years ago. And I was in an audience that I didn't know well, a huge audience. So I was trying to be nice, and I said into the microphone, because I was speaking, Rabbi Heck, you're everywhere. It's so nice to see you. His identical twin stood up and scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> so anyway, it was funny. But I am honored to be here tonight, and I want to thank, certainly with Howard, there's a new event, idea, something so positive coming out of him no matter where he is and i want to thank him for pulling this together that is what he does the manhattan jewish historical initiative was his idea and to be here at bryant park with such a beautiful evening it means a lot to all of us it means a lot to uh, the people here to our city's history and of course the wonderful source of the jewish community that is beloved and revered here in new york 
I have to say, as a current council member, we all have to reject all forms of anti-Semitism, including the abhorrent acts of violence and harassment targeting Jews and Jewish institutions. It's always in our mind. But the lies and achievements of our inductees tonight and those in the past, like Dr. Ruth, the stories that are shared provide a narrative of our city, one that we need to capture and preserve to ensure that the full picture of New York's growth and development is known to everyone, not just those here in the audience tonight. All of the honorees, as Mark Levine indicated, have impacted and continue to make deep and lasting contributions to social justice, to our spiritual life, to public health, to art journalism, to our civic life, to entrepreneurship, to the arts, as I said earlier, and the pursuit of equality and peace throughout our city and the country and the world. So Mazel Tov to the honorees, to their families, and to their friends. So tonight is a very special night, as it always is for this gathering. Thank you very much. So I have the great honor, a couple of people who are here. Brad Lander, our controller. The guy who I can't imagine always has a smile, always makes you happy when you see him. It's an amazing thing, Brad. Why don't you say a few words? Uh, thank you so much, Howard. Howard doesn't like when we keep praising him, but he shouldn't do such good work if he doesn't want us to keep praising him. Howard, this is really an extraordinary lineup. Uh, I love following Gail. You know, Gail, we admire in so many ways, and there's so many things she does that you're like, I really saw Gail doing that. I did not foresee Gail becoming the one woman armada against the illegal smoke shops. Uh, but I don't know if you've seen her out there. It's quite extraordinary. She's really, uh, so thank you, Gail. And what I'll observe is the following. You know, I'm, I'm not a Manhattan uh, Jew, I'm a Brooklyn Jew. Uh, but they, you know, Mark and others let me uh, across the way here. But my daughter, uh, who's now 19, who grew up in Brooklyn, went to uh, Bard High School on the Lower East Side. And as a result of that, uh, she started uh, going to and then eventually did an internship at the Lower East Side uh, Tenement Museum and got very deeply into uh, Manhattan's Jewish history and especially the Lower East Side Jewish history. So much so that she did a, a, a walking tour, she developed a walking tour, uh, um, a Jewish Youth of the Lower East Side, 1919 and 2019 when she was, uh, and she designed this uh, walking tour and uh, went to the Seward Park Library, went to the Forward Building, which is of course now converted to condos. So she told the story both of how like the socialists fought the communists, all the Jews of the Lower East Side in, in 1919 and how they were dealing with gentrification in, in 2019. Kind of an amazing walking tour. I don't know, Howard, maybe we can like uh, uh, pick that up sometime. But what I was inspired by is here is this 19-year-old young Jewish woman uh, and her friends, Jewish and non-Jewish, so diverse, so smart, building that future of New York City deeply grounded in its history and traditions. And every one of you who's rightly getting inducted tonight, and everyone on the board who's put this organization together, uh, and who does so much to lift that history up, it's amazing to honor, uh, but what's even better is that you are building the platform for an equally flourishing Jewish future, because in this city, in this borough, today, we have Jews across the religious spectrum, across the political spectrum, from every corner of the planet, speaking an incredible diversity of languages and creating the music and food and culture and learning and religion and technology that is tomorrow's Hall of Fame as well. Um, and we feel so grateful for all you guys have done to pave the way and build that platform for that next generation and generations to come to thrive. Thank you very much, congratulations. For one moment, would you just turn to my right and say thank you to NYPD that is always there for us all the time. NYPD, those who parked illegally, where can they find their cars? Brooklyn Navy Yard? Thank you so much for the NYPD valet parking program. We appreciate it. Let me also uh, recognize someone uh, who's a close friend, and I admire the great work that he and the museum do. Jack Klieger from the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I have to one of the most meaningful moments, Jack, was when 
Cardinal Dolan uh, and a number of us visited the museum to see the exhibit on Auschwitz. Thank you for opening those doors as widely as possible because it's a great treasure in our city. I now have the honor of introducing, it says here, the Acting Consul General of Israel. Israel needs son, enough with the acting. You get the part. Would you welcome someone who I think represents all communities? If you look at the flag of Israel, it's interesting, it has two triangles going in opposite directions. And very often that speaks to our people, that we can have different points of view, but we're all on one flag. So welcome, Consul General of Israel, Israel Nitsan. Thank you, thank you very much. Robert Potestic. It is, it is a privilege, a, a real privilege to be here with you today. Um, to congratulate the, uh, the Manhattan Jewish Historical Initiative. Of course, Howard, again, congratulations and thank you very much for this wonderful, wonderful event. Uh, I want to congratulate the honorees. I had the privilege to sit right next to Cheryl Fishbein and it's good to spend this afternoon uh, with you. You know, our mission here, I work at the, at the Israeli consulate, the Consulate General of Israel in New York. We're, uh, we are the Israeli embassy to the American Jewish community. Because of many reasons, but I think that what is important to say today is that because, one, first of all, this is the largest Jewish community outside of Israel, but it's also, this is where things started. We're celebrating these days 75 years to, the, uh, to our Independence Day, the independence of the state of Israel, which is a miracle in which uh, we managed to create a country with many challenges and many difficulties. Nothing is perfect, but, um, and we're very proud of it. But we're also celebrating these days 75 years to the relations between Israel and the United States. Uh, that recognized Israel immediately after its establishment. And I think that this is the occasion also to thank this group um, and, the, and the Jewish community here in, in New York and in Manhattan for working so hard for creating, in order to create and to build this relationship, this very special and deep relationship, the deep bond between our peoples, our shared values that we appreciate and value so much. Your work here, and especially in this, uh, in this initiative, is very important because knowing the history we all know is important for our future. It is important for your future, and recognizing, documenting, recording the future and the, the I'm sorry, the history of the, of, the, of the Jewish community here in Manhattan, in New York, and in the United States is a critical work that should be commended. So I want to thank you again for inviting me. Thank you very much. To, it's, it's a, a really a privilege to sit, to sit and to stand here with, the, with a group of leaders from this uh, amazing, amazing city and uh, an incredible borough. And again, thank you very much and congratulations to all the uh, inductees. Thank you. You've heard of Tin Pan Alley. Well, when you heard of Tin Pan Alley, he heard of it, and he did something about it. There's now a street that's named after it. He has concerts and events. We got to know each other. We ran into each other again. And there are a couple of interesting facts he'll tell you about. I'm just going to do a quick intro, which is we now are going to have a project in terms of the Jewish participation in Tin Pan Alley, which is very, very important. And I learned something that I didn't know, maybe you all know it, Lori certainly knows it with her tourism group, of the extraordinary black com community in Harlem we know about. Did you know that one of, back around 1880 to 1920, the third largest Jewish center, I don't mean a synagogue, but gathering of Jews, about 150,000 or so, was up in Harlem. And I had no idea. And that's where George will come in, because he'll tell you more about what is this thing called Tin Pan Alley 
And John here wrote a book on blacks and Jews in Harlem. And so they'll be developing cultural events, concerts, we'll be in Harlem, we'll bring the two communities together because what we found, that's why you're hearing Irving, Irving Berlin tonight, and you'll hear at the end Robert Lamont singing a song by a black composer of the same time, Tin Pan Alley. So over the next months, we're going to do something very special, which is to show the black and Jewish community together, the African and American and Jewish community together, producing things for the world. And that's really important in the most positive way of what they did. We're going to bring it from 1880 to 1920 to 2020 as well in showing all of the, the arts and, and wonderfulness that's being created by all the community in a positive way. If you want to fight hate, the best way to do it is show how great we are. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, and thank you, MJHI, for including us. I'm George Calderaro. I'm the founding director of the Tin Pan Alley American Popular Music Project, which was created to continue and commemorate the legacy of the birthplace of American popular music right on 28th Street between Broadway and 6th Avenue, where in the late 19th century, for the first time, sheet music publishers, songwriters, and performers worked together to create the American popular music industry. Names that you know we've already heard from um, Irving Berlin, but George Gershwin, and then also African Americans like Williams and Walker and J. Rosamond Johnson and James Weldon Johnson and Bob Cole, among others, worked side by side, maybe not in the same room, but on the same street. There, by the end of, uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, there were dozens of sheet music publishers creating uh, songs that we know to this day, such as Take Me Out to the Ball Game, as just one of dozens of examples that came from 28th Street, went to the uh, theaters when that area was the entertainment and cultural center of New York City around the world. Uh, so it's a real global phenomenon. So the Tim Pan Alley is known worldwide, but now you are among the few people who know that it was on 28th Street. I can't tell you how many times people say to me, I know Tin Pan Alley, that was the Brill Building. Well, that's the vertical Tin Pan Alley because Tin Pan Alley, like Hollywood, as Hollywood became synonymous for filmmaking, Tin Pan Alley became synonymous with music publishing and songwriting. So we are happy to carry that mantle forward with, as, uh, as Howard said, we've renamed the street and momentously with the support of Gail Brewer when she was our borough president, among various other uh, uh, leaders, uh, private people, uh, descendants of sheet music publishers. On December 10th, 2019, we successfully worked with the Landmarks Commission to have five Tin Pan Alley, five buildings designated as Tin Pan Alley Cultural Landmarks. And that was a long-term goal. Now that, now that they are there and we will be able to preserve them, we have lots of programmings. We have concerts at the Hudson River Park, uh, the Museum of the City of New York, etc. You can look at tinpanalley.nyc and see everything that we're doing, but I'm going to invite our board member and historian uh, and friend and colleague John Reddick to talk a little bit more about uh, his area of expertise. Thank you, George. That was great. I just want to say I was drawn to be involved with Tin Pan Alley of my interest in architecture and preservation, and that's what brought me uh, to Harlem as well in the early part of the 1980s. And we were talking about uh, the strongest branch is, is the strongest its roots, and I came to New York to, to discover my roots in Harlem, and I saw how much architecture in a physical uh, city was a backdrop for uh, elevated African American life. Uh, behind Marcus Garvey were shanties. It was the imperial city uh, in terms of the architecture. And it took 20 years, though, before I realized that it had the same effect for the Jewish community moving up from the Lower East Side. The diversity of that community who lived under the elevated train compared to who lived on the avenue. Uh, there was a diversity of income that supported both of our groups in the early part of the 20th century. And what bonded us out of music was the outsider how we saw ourselves as outsiders. And as we looked at Tin Pan Alley and the crafting of that music, we could see that all of us, the blacks and the Jews, were trying to figure out how to be American. And the first ballot box, even before the vote, 
is entertainment and what people decide they love or don't love. And actors and music actually start to put, throw out into the world things we haven't even thought about yet. And so being involved with Tin Pan Alley and seeing how for African Americans it made our names international. You weren't just writing the song and no one knew who you were. It started to put you out in the world. And our work together, as you honor genius and the 10 inductees today, we have a shared history of genius and excellence. And as we go through these difficult times today, where who do they turn on and point to and make scapegoats? It's the same, if you're talking about 1898, you could be talking about today. And together, working together and looking at our cultural and shared history together, as outsiders, we created the American voice and we can do it again. And Howard, I, I congratulate you for thinking about that and moving that forward. And so as we look at Tin Pan Alley, you can feel when you walk down that street, the accessibility of those five buildings that were townhouse brownstones converted in commercial use. Well, the black artists could stand out in the street, not like the Brill building that had to go up on the elevator and get past the receptionist. In those days, there was a face-to-face -face connectivity that allowed us to move our world together. And I hope we can continue to, to do that as we move forward. So congratulations to all the inductees. I hope to see you up in Harlem and some of our programs down the pike. And have a great day. Thank you. Uh, oh, we want me to talk about this? Oh, the song that's coming after this is, uh, well, Irving Berlin, Alexander's Ragtime Band is going to be the next song. And you're going to end with Shelton Brooks at the end, whose song was, uh, was a very famous uh, uh, song that was done by an African-American composer named Shelton Brooks, who remind me of this singer, Sophie, Sophie Tucker. <laughs> Can you play a Don Alum? <laughs> oh, just next time. All right. When I first became a rabbi, uh, I was appointed as chaplain of the Federal Prison of New York, which was then on West Street. Matter of fact, when I walked in tonight, I saw some familiar faces uh, from those years. But I tell you that because recently we had a meeting with the Department of Corrections, and they asked for religious materials that could be placed on the tablets. And I said, one of the great writers in the Jewish world is Rabbi Mark Angel. And we are going to see to it that his materials are placed there so people can learn more about tradition. I went to school with Rabbi Angel. He was the one student in the class that broke the curve. 
He always did better than anyone else. So we are very fortunate uh, to have Rabbi Angel. By the way, go to his website, uh, www.jewishideas.org. Read his material, and I think you'll be very, very impressed. And can we also have Marvin Marcus come forward to present, to interview? Welcome, everyone. It's my honor to introduce you to Rabbi Mark Angel. He's the founder and director of the Institute for Jewish Idea and Ideals, fostering an intellectually vibrant, compassionate, and inclusive Orthodox Judaism. He is Rabbi Emeritus of the historic congregation Sherith Israel, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue of New York City, founded in 1654, where he began serving in 1969. Born and raised in the Sephardic community of Seattle, Washington, he went to New York for his higher education at Yeshiva University, where he earned his BA, MS, and PhD in rabbinic ordination. He also earned an MA in English Literature from the City College of New York. He is the author and editor of 38 books. He has written and lectured extensively on various aspects of Jewish law and history. Just as an aside, we spoke about before the Jewish Lower East Side, and everybody knows about the Ashkenazim Jews of the Lower East Side, but few people know about the Sephardic Jews that existed on the Lower East Side. Rabbi Angel is a true Sephardic Jew, his family lineage goes back to the island of Rhodes in Greece, where for centuries, Sephardic Jews lived there up until World War II. Rabbi Angel is past president of the Rabbinical Council of America. He has served as officer and board member of numerous ages, including the UJA Federation, American Sephardi Federation, Jewish National Fund, and Healthcare Chaplaincy. He has won awards for many institutions, including Yeshiva University, the Orthodox Union, and the New York Board of Rabbis. Rabbi Angel is married to Gilda Angel, sitting in the audience. Their children and grandchildren who are here live in New York, Baltimore, and Teaneck. Rabbi Angel, what was it like being the rabbi of the oldest Jewish congregation in America? First of all, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? First of all, thank you very much to all of you for organizing this wonderful event. Thank you, Marvin, for your introduction. And uh, before I get into my thing, I wanted to say, 57 years ago, yesterday, Gilda and I had our first date. That is the most important historical thing I could say tonight. And we're still going strong. I grew up in Seattle, as was mentioned. My grandparents came from Turkey and from the island of Rhodes. I grew up in a community that all the old timers spoke Spanish, Judeo-Spanish. I came to New York in 1963 to college. Gilda and I got married right after college in 1967. I was in rabbinical school in 1969 when Sherith Israel, the historic Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, needed an assistant rabbi, a student rabbi. And I was there and I was, I got the job. I thought it would be one year. I'm still there as emeritus after all these years. I want to remember the first Rosh Hashanah because this is a historical event. I was a 24-year-old kid, just still in rabbinical school, and I sat right next to the Rabbi Emeritus, David de Sola Pool, one of the great rabbis of American Jewish life, and a man I admired from my youth. At the end of services, Dr. Pool, who was then in his 80s, put his hand on my head and gave me a blessing. May you have a happy and successful ministry. I was 24 years old. Dr. Poole put his hand on my head. He started at Sherith Israel in 1907. Dr. Poole took over from Dr. Mendez, who started in 1877. A few more steps backwards to 1768 was Gershom Mendez Satius. I was a 24-year-old kid, and I suddenly realized I'm old. There's a history. There's a tradition. A Spanish and Portuguese synagogue founded in 1654. I'm in an institution over 300 years old. I learned patience, calmness. Don't get nervous. There are ups and downs in life. But don't judge things by the moment. See things generationally. Plan ahead. A congregation that's in business for 300 years knows what it's doing. 
very powerful, very important. But just as the congregation taught me to be patient, it also taught me to be impatient. We live in an imperfect world. We need change. We don't want to wait for the Messiah in 50 years or 100 years. We have to be involved. And Sheriff Israel had that wonderful tradition going back to colonial days when our members fought the American Revolution. This is the synagogue of Emma Lazarus, whose poem graces the Statue of Liberty. This is the synagogue of Justice Benjamin Nathan Cardozo. This is the, con this is the, the congregation of Judge Edgar Nathan, who was also a Manhattan Borough President in his time. This was a congregation with ideals, and we have an activism to change the world. It was a great privilege to serve a congregation so diverse, with such amazing people. There are very few rabbis after 50 years who could say they really love their congregation. I can say so. The greatest people I ever had known in my life were people of our congregation and community. Thank you, Rabbi Angel. I'd like to present this to you now. NJHI's Manhattan Jewish Hall of Fame Class of 2023 inductee. In recognition of your Manhattan heritage and your lifetime achievement, you epitomize what makes our country great. Rabbi Mark G. Angel. Thank you very much. I have to add one thing, please. I want to add one thing, that one of the great pleasures of my rabbinate is having wonderful children and grandchildren, and especially being able to work with my son, Rabbi Chaim Angel, in our institute. Thank you. I introduce to you the inductee, the amazing Richard Gottfried, former assemblyman, and our conversant presenter with thrilled Councilwoman Gail Brewer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a huge honor for me. I think you know how wonderful Dick Gottfried is. He's a graduate of Stuyvesant High School when Jerry Nadler was there and Dick Morris. And then he has a bachelor's from Cornell and then went to law school at Columbia University. 52 years in the New York State Assembly, and it is 18,993 days in the New York State Assembly. Uh, longest serving uh, individual ever. You know about health care, but it is an incredible uh, history. Prenatal care assistance, child health plus, family health plus, physician profiling law, family health care decisions, health proxy, HIV testing, reproductive freedom, uh, patient autonomy, everything to do with end of life and pain, ways to make people feel better. Obviously, he also was the author of the Hudson River Park, the Jacob Javits Center, the Omnibus Crime Act, the Juvenile Justice Reform Act, same-sex marriage, gender, and the list goes on. He's also one hell of a wonderful human being. Everybody loves him. I remember when I first ran for office, I went to meet with him. What the hell am I supposed to do about health care? And he sat down with me for two or three hours and went through everything, as he has done for many others. As you heard earlier, he's the kind of elected officials we all strive to be. So I give you the amazing Dick Gottfried, retired but never really retired. Dick Gottfried. Well, thank, thank you, Gail. Um, this is such a wonderful, happy evening, uh, just listening to everything that everybody has to say. Um, you know, in thinking about Jewish history, uh, as I've been thinking for the last several weeks, uh, in looking forward to this event, one thing that has, a, that has occurred to me again and again and that I want to share with all of you, I know next to nothing about the history of my grandparents in the old country. And they came from two or three different old countries, but it was always the old country. I know very little about their life here in America. Uh, I remember when I was about 11 years old, I was working on a school paper about the history of Ellis Island. And my grandmother, who came over in 1904, asked me what I was working on. And I told her. And she said, oh, I could tell you stories about Ellis Island. 
and like a complete 11 year old idiot, I said, no, no, that's not what this paper is about. And so I never heard my grandmother tell me about her stories about Ellis Island. And I think about that often and how that history is lost forever. What little I know about my grandparents' life in the old country, I know from Fiddler on the Roof. Because as far as I know, their village, or their villages, my, they came from two different villages close together, uh, ended up like in Fiddler on the Roof. But I don't really know that for sure. So I would just want to say to each and every one of you tonight that have grandchildren or the equivalent of grandchildren in your lives, tell them your story so that your story will live on. Uh, you know, my four and a half year old granddaughter and my 22 and a half year old granddaughter, and yes, the spacing was intentional, um, I need to tell them about my story and what little I know of my parents' story and unfortunately the nothing that I know of my grandparents' story. It is so important that our histories live on. So I urge each and every one of you, if you have not already done so, be sure you tell your story to your grandchildren so that our stories may live. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to just add, he is also an artist. You can often find him uh, drawing and calligraphy. It's gorgeous. It gets shown. It's just one more aspect of Dick Godfrey that he can share with his grandchildren. Hall of Fame is here, class of 2023 inductee. And it says to Honorable Richard Godfrey, and it says very specifically, in recognition of your Manhattan heritage and your lifetime achievement, your optimism of what makes our country great. You epitomize what makes our country great. May 9th, 2023. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you all. So, Harold Holzer, I've gotten to know over the last few years. And from the Metropolitan Museum, where he was a leader, to being the ultimate scholar of Lincoln in the world, I believe, practically, to now being the director of the Roosevelt House, and on and on. This is the most amazing man, and we're thrilled that you're coming into the Hall of Fame. It's really a great honor for us. But the one thing, a couple of things I didn't know, which he told me about. Bella, you worked with Bella. Tell us about what was that like, because when you think about legend, Jewish legendary people in Manhattan, there's Bella. Well, um, I just want to say how grateful I am to you, Howard, and to the board, and how excited I am to be here. And thinking back, to, I, I'll answer the question, I yeah, promise. Sure. Thinking back a little bit earlier, before I worked for Bella, I was the editor of a weekly newspaper called the Manhattan Tribune. And I think I wrote the first article about Dick Gottfried and Jerry Nadler and the crew, the, uh, the young progressives who were coming up on the west side of Manhattan. Gail was a child at the time. Elise wasn't even born. Elise Buxbaum, who is here. So, yes, and then I was lucky enough to be asked by the great Bella Abzug to be her press secretary. And I always say that was my graduate school. I learned everything I needed to know for the rest of my life from that astonishing woman. Was it easy? It wasn't always easy, but it was the greatest professional experience of my life because she was a great woman. And to travel all over New York State and watch her come this close to becoming the first woman United States Senator uh, from New York was a thrill. And, and what, you wrote a book, I believe, Abraham Lincoln and the Jews, or the Jewish people. I didn't write the book, but I curated the exhibition at the New York Historical oh, yeah? Society. Yeah, which is a whole other story. I'm doing a book now on Twenty Lincoln. seconds. On the Jews, on Lincoln and the Jews. He was, uh, he was the first president to allow Jewish chaplains in the Union Army. And when Ulysses S. Grant 
banned Jews from the entire Western theater of the Civil War, Lincoln, knowing he was his only successful general, still overturned the order. And that, you know, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise and others petitioned him and he responded. So he goes down in Jewish history too. That's great. One of the things that we instructed all of the inductees, whatever our questions are, they can give whatever answers they want. <laughs> so, so right now you're at Roosevelt House, and I remember I, just a couple of weeks ago I was doing a Kennedy thing, he said, no, we're the Roosevelt House. Um, but Roosevelt means a lot to you, obviously. And, and why don't you talk a second about it? The house, which I hope all of you know about, is on 65th Street between Madison and Park Avenues. It's not only Roosevelt's home and political headquarters, it's the place where 90 years ago, he, he, he staged the presidential transition in that modest place. I mean, modest compared to other recent presidential transition headquarters, not far from. Um, in that little library, Frances Perkins said she would serve as the cabinet member only if FDR committed to minimum wage, maximum hours, old and old age pensions. So the place I work is the place where Social Security was born. Dr. Ruth, where for that, right? Social Security forever. So that, it's a privilege to be there and to have, to educate undergraduates in public policy and human rights and tribute to Eleanor, and also to hold public programs, some of which Howard has organized and will do more. And, and we're proud, it's part of Hunter College and your president, outgoing though she be, uh, is a member of our Hall of Fame from a few years ago. Right. So she said she was sorry she couldn't be here, but she's going to many events in her honor right now, Jennifer Rabb, and she's very proud that she preceded me into the Hall of Fame, for sure. So with about 30 seconds or so to go, last words, what would you like to say to everybody in terms of what this means, what, you, what you're doing, and candidly, the next 50 years ahead for you. I want to be like Dr. Ruth. I want to be 95 years old and thinking about sex. <laughs> Thanks very much. Congratulations. Harold, I wasn't clear. You said thinking about it. I just want to make sure we get the right verb. That's all. Uh, Patty is with Kenner. Recently, uh, I told Governor Hochul that you were being honored tonight. And she said to me, you tell Patty the following, that a friendship is one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself. To have Patty Kenner as a friend is a great blessing. So Patty, come forward. Tina Weiss. OK, good evening. Um, I'm pleased to be in conversation with Patty this evening. And Patty's bio really runs the gamut. Um, Born in New York City, yeah. And you grew up in Harrison, New York. Excellent. Um, you've been involved in so many different things. Education. You worked as a teacher for over ten years. Fantastic. And filmmaking. Filmmaking. Yeah. Jewish organizational life. So many different organizations, including the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And beyond, of course. You also head up your family's business, the Campus Coach Lines, founded by your father. And so can you give us a few highlights about your professional life and how you got involved in the variety of organizations that you've been drawn to? Well, you said all the things I was going to say. Sorry. Um, I am a man. I was born in Manhattan, as you said, and as soon as I finished college, I rushed right back to Manhattan, became a school teacher in Harlem. My main goals are really to educate and to do good work. When I was in high school, my grandfather said to me, noblesse oblige, he said, we're a very lucky family, and that means that you have a responsibility. I think I took it too seriously because every day I wake up, I say, well, what did I do today? So 
even though I take it seriously, I love the life that I live. I'm very proud of what I do every single day. Um, I do run my family business, and on the side, I, I'm on 16 boards, which makes me so proud. Um, I started with the Educational Alliance on the Lower East Side, and many of you know the Alliance. I'm on the board of UJA, and I chair the Community Initiative on Holocaust Survivors. Holocaust survivors are a very great part of my life, as are Holocaust refugees, like my darling best friend, Dr. Ruth Westheimer. What it's amazing is not only are you doing something to help Holocaust survivors, but what's really amazing is what you get from them. To talk to Dr. Ruth every day and to hear myself whine and complain about what's wrong and to have Ruth put life in perspective. Ruth is my hero. Ruth lives every day dancing, as you saw a few minutes ago, makes you proud to be alive, proud to be a Jewish woman. On the Museum of Jewish Heritage, my goal of educating is fulfilled every single day. The governor has agreed that every single child in New York City should go to the Museum of Jewish Heritage and learn about education <laughs> and the Holocaust. My, our next exhibit will be called Courage to Act. It will be the first exhibit of the Danish rescue, and it will be for children in the third grade to the sixth grade, so that at a very early age, children will learn that you have to have the courage to act, and you have to stand up and always do the right thing. Um, I've also gotten into the movies. A very close friend was Dr. Ruth Gruber. I made a documentary film with several friends who are here, Doris and Denise. And we made a film about Dr. Ruth Gruber, who was a humanitarian who saved refugees. I made a movie. I'm so happy the last speaker alluded to Fiddler on the Roof because I produced the film Fiddler, A Miracle of Miracles. And my newest film is on Raoul Wallenberg, who was a Danish... Uh, a Swedish diplomat who saved many, many people. So my goals of education and humanitarian work and educating about the Holocaust have all been fulfilled and I'm very proud to be here and I want to congratulate the other honorees. Thank you. Thank you. We are so honored that you're with us this evening and we hope that you will continue in all the different areas uh, that you have been involved with and it should uh, be with great success as you continue and all the different endeavors. Thank you. There's one more thing I wanted to tell the, um, the Israeli gentleman that, um, speaking of heritage, my great-grandfather designed the flag of Israel. Dr. Haas, I do radio every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. I'm the original Morning Joe. Those of you who watch the other Morning Joe, I'm sure look forward to presentations by Dr. Richard Haas. Uh, his rabbi, Elliot Costco, Park Avenue Synagogue, said to me recently, not only is this person a mensch, he's a shul mensch. Comes to synagogue regularly for services. Great honor to have Dr. Richard Haas interviewed by Jerome Gopson. Okay. Richard Haas is probably the preeminent foreign policy expert in the United States. I'm not exaggerating by much. And so I don't have to really go into the background and spend too much time. Richard Haas has been the president of the Council on Foreign Relations uh, for many years. He was the director of the policy planning staff of the State Department, which deals with everything. He has written 12 amazing books on foreign policy and many of you, millions of Americans, have seen him whenever there's a foreign policy crisis. 
So, uh, Richard, I would like to, um, uh, I've heard some of these subjects, I've heard you discuss them for an hour. We have 45 seconds here. So I will, I will shift to Ukraine because I want to take advantage of it. The war has been going on for a year. A lot of unexpected things have happened. Where do you think we'll be in three or four years? Well, first of all, it's good to be with all you and the pollen. I enjoy it. Uh, look, I would, it, none of us, if we had had this meeting, what, 16 months ago, none of us would have predicted that Ukraine would have been where it is today. It's an extraordinary triumph for Ukraine, for NATO, for the United States. Aggression has been stymied. I don't think, however, that Ukraine will be in a position to liberate its territory through the use of arms. So my prediction is that after this fighting season ends towards the end of this year, I believe that Ukraine, together with its supporters in the West, will, become, will begin to turn to diplomacy. It's also possible that Russia might edge in that direction when they understand that they cannot achieve their goals through the use of force. This could be an opportunity, an opening for the United States, conceivably working with, of all countries, China, to promote the possibility, not of peace, but at least a winding down of the war. Uh, I was going to ask you about Israel. Time is flying by, so if we have time, I'll come back to it. In your career, have you ever felt endangered? <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you one story. Whenever you travel with the president or the secretary of state, the night before you're given a schedule of where you have to be at exact times the next morning, what meeting and what room, where in the motorcade and so forth. So one day I was traveling with secretary of state James Baker and I was assigned uh, his car in the motorcade at whatever it was, 6.30 in the morning and this was in Lebanon and we were the first senior American delegation to get a lot, go to Lebanon for years because of the hostage taking and the attacks on American troops there. So I was feeling pretty good saying, ah, the Secretary of State finally wants to get the benefit of my perspective, my wisdom, my insight. I got in the car, I waited, I waited, and then suddenly it was just me and the Secret Service. The car began to move and suddenly it dawned on me, I was the decoy. <laughs> so fortunately you made it here yeah. and so we're so happy that you were able to survive it. Uh, your Jewish background, I happen to know about it because I've seen you at Park Avenue Synagogue over the years many times. Not just, by the way, on Yom Kippur, we have an extraordinary tradition. In the two-hour break, we don't stop. Richard Haas provides a one-and-a-half-hour tour de force on world affairs in the middle of Yom Kippur, and then we continue to pray. So, uh, it just proves there is no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> what has your Jewish background meant to you in, in your life, maybe in your profession? I find it, I, I grew up, by the way, I was born in Brooklyn, sorry, it's Manhattan. Grew up in Valley Stream, went to Temple Gates of Zion, had a Jewish education, became a religion major initially at, at college, went to live in Israel. Uh, I find religion in some ways is the best background uh, for someone like myself who worked early on in his career on the Middle East you cannot begin to understand the politics, the dynamics of the Middle East uh, without it. And then I think morally, there's that moment on Yom Kippur when you do the al khait and you have all the sins that you apologize, you ask forgiveness for, and all of the sins are acts of, the things that you do, acts of commission, except for the final sin. It is the act, it is the, it's an act of omission. It is an action, the Hebrew basically translate as a confused heart. It's when you don't act when you should. In my experience in politics, my greatest regrets are the things I didn't do, not the things I did. And that's what that teaches me. That comes directly from the, from the service on Yom Kippur. The final question. You recently wrote a book, a little different from your foreign policy books. It's called The Bill, not of Rights, but The Bill of Obligations. The 10 Habits of Great Citizens. Sort of sounds like my junior high school civics book. Uh, could you tell us, not all 10, if you had to choose one of those obligations that you would want to share with this audience, uh, what would it be? Yeah, the argument of the book is that as important as rights are, citizenship also requires obligations of everybody sitting here to one another, of everybody sitting here to this country uh, uh, of ours. 
To me, the most important is that we need to start teaching civics in our schools, require it in high school, require it as a condition of graduation in college. And again, the inspiration of all places comes from Judaism. Let me just uh, give you the, what specifically led to it. Think where you are on Passover. You're sitting at the table at the Seder. What are you reading? The Haggadah. What is that? The telling. And what is the obligation? It is the, it is the obligation of every generation of Jews to tell the story of the Exodus. That is the way Jews have kept alive and kept together through the centuries of persecution and the centuries of diaspora. And my concern for America is we have stopped teaching our story. You can now graduate from virtually any college or university in this country or any high school in this country and be essentially illiterate about the American story. And we at the bottom of it, we are a country based upon a story, not on race, not on color, not on religion, not on inherited wealth. We are a people, we are a country based on an idea, and we need to teach that idea. Richard, thank you very much. And I want to say, we often hear the phrase, thank you for your service. I mean that, thank you for your service to the country and in explaining some of the most complicated issues that Americans need to understand. And I look forward to seeing you at Park Avenue Synagogue as another Jew in the pew. Next, I'd like to have Ken Swig with the presenter, Alan Segan. Thank you, Howard. And congratulations, Kent, on an honor well-deserved. Kent is a dear friend a New York City businessman, a philanthropist, with a great story, a story that he could tell better than I can, a story of how he got to New York, a journey from the West Coast to the East Coast, shaping this city and shaping a lot of other wonderful cities around the world. Ken, please. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, Howard, really, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and it's an honor to be here, and uh, certainly a humbling honor, uh, surrounded by all the great people who've been inducted tonight. So congratulations. Um, and nice to see you uh, from behind the curtain, Alan, to be out in public for a change. It's a good thing. And my wife, Jennifer, hello. Um, so uh, my journey, I started, uh, the first time I came to New York, I was 10 years old. And uh, probably the first time that I ever had my shoulders down and relaxed and felt like I was in a home. Uh, and it took me a little while to get here. I went to uh, undergrad uh, at Brown University and studied Chinese history. Uh, then went back to uh, San Francisco after uh, a living in China for about five months. Went to law school there and finally was able to move to uh, New York in 1987. Um, and the reason I think I came here is because alternate side parking was suspended for sukkahs. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to live in a, in, a, in a place that had a Jewish soul. And, and New York, uh, for me, was it. And it's where I felt comfortable and, and, and wanted to spend my life, which I did. Um, and one of the first places, uh, my first place of work was a Grace Building on the 34th floor um, at Swigweiler and Arno with my family, um, where Howard, you also used to uh, go up there. And, um, and I guess my first home outside of my home was Israel Bonds. And there I met my mentors and friends like uh, Larry Silverstein, the late uh, Burt Resnick, um, and, and a wealth of people that, that took me in and, and guided me and, and made me feel good. Um, I then, of course, had to go shul shopping right, where, where I ended up at Central Synagogue and was fortunate and privileged to be able to be on the board there for, for nine years um, and, and then grew to have uh, a, a wonderful and a Jewish life in New York. And your family played an important role in your personal and business journey throughout your whole life. Could you give us a little bit of that background and Okay, my great-grandfather came over, Simon Swig, who uh, my oldest son is named after, came over from uh, Lithuania uh, in probably the late 1870s. Um, he had one of 11 children. He, uh, he had 11 children. My grandfather, Ben Swig, uh, was the seventh of 11 children, which uh, became lucky numbers in my family's history. And then my father, Mel Swig, uh, uh, was born. 
um, in Boston, where my entire family uh, uh, originated from after uh, coming over from Lithuania. Uh, in 1946, my grandfather took a train out to San Francisco and ended up buying the Fairmont Hotel. Uh, and at that time, uh, life was, a, they were very religious and it was either with my grandmother, either everybody moved out together or they, everybody stayed in Boston. So the entire Mishpucha came out and moved over to uh, San Francisco and ultimately I was born there and, uh, and raised there and, and, and came over. But the, the set of values uh, and traditions from one family member to another family member throughout um, was an extraordinary, extraordinary gift. Um, one of the big influences um, in our family was, the, you know, a patriarchal uh, 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 family, um, which for me was, you know, as good as we were, we weren't as good as we could be. So uh, the first thing I did in, in, in my business life when I got old enough, older after my father passed away was to change the dynamic in our family and go to a matriarchal uh, part and, and, uh, and ended up with my cousin who was the chairman of our company and, and, and grew, grew the, the, the female side of our business which made us better, stronger, more thoughtful, more sensitive. And um, so that tradition has continued in a very, very nice way. And Kent, I know you to be an optimist always, and we're going through some difficult times here in New York, and reference to the 75th anniversary of the State of Israel, perhaps some difficult times there. A bit of your thoughts, your optimistic thoughts on where we are in New York and where the State of Israel might be. Well, for New York City, I'm, I'm a big fan and I love New York City. Um, and Center City has really started with, with business, right? Business as the center of the city and that grew and people grew and they lived in the city and expanded and, 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 you, and for Manhattan and New York City, it grew and grew with the center of business. That's not happening today anymore because people aren't going to the office as much. Um, but what's, what's remarkable about New York City is the people, which it always is, and, and the cities now are growing and, 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 and living and doing wonderful, not because of the business, but because of the people who live here. So it's now the residential community that's, that's thriving in New York City and becoming the centerpiece, and businesses are hanging on and, and are here because people want the energy and they want the vitality of living together. So it's, it's not the business that's driving the pulse of New York, it's the residential that's driving the, the pulse of New York. And that's a fabulous thing. I can only say that people don't work in silos and we don't work well in, 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 in the individual outskirts of life. And it's the coming together that brings business, it brings creativity, it brings opportunity, it brings all of the successes through an organization of, of working together and community. And that is why we all need to be back at the office a little bit more and, and bring together a humanity and, and learning how to get community back. And you can't do it in silos. Um, so that, that's what, as far as 75th of Israel, you know, I, I look back at my grandfather and my great-grandfather and, and wish they could see, hopefully God bless they are. Um, but, the, but, and Jack Weiler also, who, who would be just unbelievably thrilled and, and teary-eyed to think of our celebration of 75 years. And it's my thrill and my pleasure to present you with the class of 2023 Manhattan Jewish Hall of Fame. Um, I don't know if he's still here, the Consul General of Panama, Elias Levy Cohen, who, most wonderful, there he is. We're going to have you come up for a second, because the story of Panama and the Jewish community there, I want to give you 30 seconds to just tell us a little about that. Okay, nice. I will talk very fast about the Panamanian Jewish community. The first Panamanian arrived, uh, the first Jewish arrived to Panama in the 18th century. They came from Holland, near Netherlands, Caribbean, and Portuguese Jewish. After that, we were involved with the separation of Panama from Colombia. And, may, and some of that negotiation take place here in New York. Actually, 34th and 5th Avenue, where is the, where the Empire State, 
before was the world of a story hotel and negotiations take, took, took um, place there. Now in Panama, we are around 1,400,000 14, uh, Jewish, very, very well close community. We have in our minds that if we keep our traditions, we, we keep alive our religion our, and our people. And we, well, we are very proud. Um, and in closing, I invite every one of you to Panama. There's a very, very nice Jewish community. You could keep kosher if you want. You could go to the beach. And the people, and the people in Panama, we are prepared to that. I think this is besides the United States and Israel, of course, Panama is the best place to, to visit if you are a Jewish. Even though that, if you know, of course, we have the Panama Canal, we have the Free Zone, we have the, old, the colonial Panama, and I invite you, every, every one of you, to visit us. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. And now it gives us the great privilege to have Deborah Messing here, who will be interviewed by Lori Weissman. Hello. 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 Okay. Um, well, Deborah Messing is an Emmy award winning actress, producer, social justice, and human rights advocate. She grew up in Rhode Island, received her BA from Brandeis University, and earned her Master's of Fine Arts from NYU's Tisch School of Arts, and resides, resides in New York City with her son. So, my first question is, along with all your other wonderful accomplishments, you're most well known from your role as the Jewish interior designer Grace Adler from TV hit show Will and Grace. Was most of Grace's overt Jewishness written into the role by the writers, or do you feel that some of it came from your own Jewish identity? It was not written into the character. Uh, it was not um, determined. And at the time, no leading uh, character on primetime television had ever been Jewish, a woman. At the time, people thought that um, Seinfeld, Julie Louis-Dreyfus's character, was Jewish, but she wasn't. And because the creators of our show, both Jewish, um, I said to them, I think we have a responsibility and we have an opportunity. And I would really love to make that an essential part of who she is. And they love the idea, and so the references to Camp Ramah and et cetera. I mean, I, I thought there were many comic opportunities. The one, the one that I think got away was the episode that, that would be Passover, where Jack and Will would be fighting over the Afikoman. Um, your record and involvement with human rights organization is impressive and inspiring. Do you think that your Jewish upbringing and your current Jewish identity help lead you toward this social advocacy? Oh, absolutely. Um, I grew up in Rhode Island. Both of my parents were born in uh, Brooklyn. And I was one of three Jewish kids in the entire public school system. Um, I distinctly remember waking up on Halloween and seeing my grandfather's car had a swastika painted on it. And um, there were many other incidents uh, that made it very clear to me from a very young age that being Jewish was being an other and that it was dangerous. And so I started hiding my identity so that I wouldn't be bullied. Meanwhile, my parents, my father was president of our temple. He was vice president of the Jewish Federation of Rhode Island. My mother was the president of the UJA National Board for Business and Professional Women. So every single night after work, they would get on the phone and they would solicit funds to help the refugees coming in from Russia or it, it, innumerable things. And they said that because because we have been 
targeted for so long. We have to speak up. We have to be visible. We have to be proud. And we have to acknowledge all the other people who are in similar situations, um, marginalized communities. And so that really, it sprung from my parents and the Jewish upbringing. And, um, and it sounds yeah. like your parents should also be winning awards here as well. <laughs> we have time for one more question? We do. Um, can you tell us what inspired you to help create I Am A Voter? Uh, I Am A Voter uh, is a nonpartisan uh, voting organization that I helped found um, to encourage uh, civic involvement. And um, I think what inspired it was the imagery of the children being separated from their parents at the border. Um, my best friend and I, Mandana Dayani, who's a refugee from Iran, a, a Persian Jew, uh, she said, this is, this is uh, catastrophic and how can this change? And we realized that everything came back to voting, everything. And so we decided that we needed to make voting cool. We needed to figure out a way to use pop culture, social media, um, athletes, singers, to make it an event um, to get people involved because that was the only way that, that we could get back on track. Well, thank you for your activism. Um, welcome to the class of 2023. Thank you very much. Dr. Red Leonard defines tikkun olam. He is a born in Brooklyn pediatrician with every child in the world his patient. He left his residency to become medical director of AmeriCorps in Lee County, Arkansas, I believe at the time the sixth poorest county in the United States, where I understand he also met his partner in life, Karen, and the two of them have been caring for the children of the world ever since. Dr. Redletter founded the Children's Health Fund. He served as president of the Mount of Your Children's Hospital. He is the director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. His voice of reason, reason and wisdom got us through the COVID crisis on cable TV and in policy councils. He most recently founded the Ukrainian Children's Action Project. Dr. Redletter, could you give us, which has taken him to Ukraine to care for children in very recently, could you give us an update on the condition of the Ukrainian children and on the ground there from the humanitarian perspective? And also, you rank as one of the heroes in the aftermath of our own disaster here of 9-11 where you brought incredible resources to the emotional recovery of the children of Lower Manhattan when, when they needed it most. I'm wondering if there are any comparisons in, in addition to the obvious differences between the children, what children are suffering in Ukraine and what we went through, and what is your prognosis for Ukraine and its children? So my, uh, thank you, Alan, and hello everyone. So my thing is, that children are the common denominator for all of us. You know, we see, Karen and I go to Ukraine pretty often. We see children who are growing up with adversity that's unimaginable, except we've seen it elsewhere. Different kinds of adversity in Arkansas and among the homeless children in New York, etc. And our whole deal is about making sure that every child has an opportunity to grow, to thrive, to be healthy, and to learn. And the other thing that's underneath all of this is our incredible attachment to our own children. And a couple of them over here, Stephanie and Arthur, and there's this guy waving over here, Oren, 
He's our youngest grandchild, and the oldest is uh, 23, but Orrin is uh, with us as a constant reminder. But this is the story with Ukraine right now and its children. So Ukraine had 7.5 million children living in the country before the war. Uh, about 5 million of them actually became part of the, either the refugee population leaving Ukraine or among the internally displaced children. And what we've been doing is trying to raise funds. We have been raising funds to make sure uh, that the children get what they need to be able to get back to some life of normalcy. And hopefully, as Richard Haas said, that will have to be mostly waiting until this horrendous war ends, where Russia's genocide of Ukraine is unbelievable and something I would never, I never would have thought I would have seen in my lifetime. Doctor, my mother always said that to build our future, we must start with our children. You have been doing that. And in your care for children, you've cared for humanity, and you've gotten us through with insight and leadership many disasters, many scourges. I want to ask you about another one that's a little different that I know is of great concern to you, and that is the, the disaster of rising anti-Semitism in this country. What do you think is causing it, and what, what should we do about it? And what, what insight do you have from your travels? You know, after my bar mitzvah, I read a lot about the Holocaust. A lot. Probably too much. But it's something I've been living with, really, for my entire adult life. And I don't think anti-Semitism has ever gone away. We are, we are, unfortunately, this is an endemic disease among mankind. And right now, we have to be really, really careful and attentive when it comes to making sure the anti-Semitism, along with racism, is squelched, is squashed. And I'll tell you, a friend of mine, Igor, who's an advisor to uh, President Zelensky, said recently, humans, people, are made up of three types, three categories. Human beings, monsters, and, uh, and cowards. And cowards. And now is a time for bravery among Jews and others who believe in justice in America. We have to deal with this. The antidote, by the way, if I could just... Am I, where are we? Time was. We're good. The antidote is voting. Deborah, uh, this is voting. You cannot allow Republican cowardice about dealing with racism, about dealing with anti Semitism. They won't even, not only are they allowing right wing extremists into our government from, from school boards to the U.S. Congress, uh, they're not speaking out about it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to get so political, but you riled me up, Alan. Um, I, I, uh, you have that habit. Anyway, I just uh, would say that I, I think the voting issue is more important than ever, and it has to be very clear what we're voting for, who we're voting for, and what we're voting against. But anyway, that's my commercial Doctor, thank you for being one of the brave Thank you for caring for our children. On behalf of the Manhattan Jewish Historical Initiative, I'm honored and privileged to present to my hero, Dr. Redman. Thank you, Alan. Your induction into the Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. Thank you. You all know Cheryl Fishbein as a great leader in the Jewish community. What you may not know is every Shabbat, she opens up her home and has people from everywhere coming to have a meal. Those of you who don't have a place to go this Shabbat, <laughs> see me after the prayer. I have her address or right, her cell number. Just feel, matter of fact, just go there and have the meal. Just tell her we sent you. So we have Cheryl Fishbein, who will be interviewed by Rhino Wasserman. Cheryl, um, you're a practicing clinical psychologist and attorney, but you've devoted your life to advance the causes of the Jewish community here in New York. You're chairing the board of the JCRC. You, all of you have to hear, you hear Cheryl will run to look up her bio. But today, I want to know the leader Cheryl Fishbein, 
who inspires all of us. How was she inspired? What gave her the motivation to do what she has done for all of us, for this wonderful city? Thank you, Brian, and thank you, everybody, for being here. It is such a joy to celebrate with all of these wonderful honorees and friends and family. And so my, my inspiration, well, I was born and bred in Brooklyn. It seems a lot of us came from Brooklyn, and it starts there. Um, so I think that gave me a certain level of oomph, right? Um, to to, I'm a child of Holocaust survivors, and the values that were in my house were very strong. Keep the Jewish people strong. Protect the Jewish people. Protect the Jewish community. And make sure that Israel is strong. And those what, it, that's what I grew up with, and that's what I took with me. But now, what, what powers me now is my amazing husband, who a lot of you know, Philip Shatton, who has taught me everything I know. And my, uh, we've got two daughters that are here, but out of our four children, and four grandchildren who are here today, who surround me with love and encouragement and affection, and they tolerate my crazy schedule uh, with everything. And so that really also pushes me because they're the future. They really are the future. But what Manhattan allowed me to do and being here in the city is it gave me the opportunity to volunteer and to ultimately take on positions of leadership. And the goal is to make sure that the Jewish community by its outreach by reaching out to others, interfaith, intergroup relations. I know Bob Kaplan is here. I know David Pollack is here. Michael Miller was here. All people who have mentored me in this, in this business um, and also allowed me, I I'm on many, many other Jewish committees and Jewish boards that helped me push the envelope of a strong, global Jewish community. And in our outreach and in our community building, not only within the, Jew, the Jewish community, which has to be speaking to each other, but across the city of New York, interfaith, interfaith, intergroup, everything that does that makes New York the wonderful, strong place that it is and it continues to keep New York strong and alive and vibrant. And um, I try to do it across the globe too. I see Jonathan Ornstein there from Krakow. It reaches across the globe. And that's what, that's what gets me up every morning and moving forward. The importance of Kun Olam to yes. all of us is part of what you do and what you can do for this community and for the communities, as you say, around the world. I think I have time for one more question, okay. which is <laughs> the dream. Has the next generation mm -hmm. taken on the responsibility of the future? You have the perspective from where you sit of understanding <laughs> and knowing where we are now where are we going and what do we have to do in 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to keep it to 30 You're seconds. I, I can do it. I think that the younger, the, the, our next community is filled with fabulous people. I see it in my own home. And they are taking on their responsibilities, but in their way. And, and I'm hoping that they learn from us, of course, because we do some things right, right guys? Um, <laughs> but 
I do understand that the world has changed and we have to change with it. And every Jewish organization that has Jewish leadership and boards has to bring in the younger generation. We have to listen to them and we have to put things into place and programs into place that will help them stay strong and help them live in, in this world. Let you have the last word and actually say it's a personal privilege to be here while you're inducted into the Jewish Hall of Fame. Thank and, you. And it's On a, a privilege to be note. here. Thank you. Now as we come to, towards the closing, uh, we have a most amazing conversation that's coming up. And I just want to make one comment about Bill Ritter, as, as I call Bill Ritter up with Rabbi Joe Potasnik. A wonderful little story about Bill Ritter. Where I first met him, I was at the Red Cross Gala. And he was up there, he was co-hosting, doing the most unbelievable job and everybody in the audience cavelling. Um, and he's giving an award to a young African-American fellow. And what does he say? Mazel <laughs> And it was just great, because that's about bringing our Jewishness into the world at large. And so, couldn't be more thrilled you're here. Rabbi Joe, you're on. This is historic for me to see Bill Ritter and not be in the back of a taxi cab. So I thank you, thank you for this moment, Bill. I've never been in the back of a taxi cab with you, <laughs> Rabbi Joe, I am not. Everybody knows you as the public personality. By the way, let's take, a moment to say hello to your wife, Catherine Friary, who's here. Uh, was with Good Morning America 2020, right? And CNN. Anderson Cooper. Yeah. And now is a media trainer. Bill, talk about Bill Ritter, the Jew, and what has meant to you over the years. I, I think my parents had the biggest impact on my lives, although I had some very incredible rabbis, um, one for most of my life, uh, up until the time my parents died. But my, my dad had a, he grew, he grew up in, in California, but he really grew up as a kid uh, in elementary school and junior high school in Emporia, Kansas. And there were, I think, four Jewish families in Emporia, Kansas, not anymore. And he would tell me and, and really drum it into my brother and I about what it meant to be a Jew in, in non-Jewish territory. Why they lived there, I don't know. The rest of the family went to St. Louis, and I, which is not far away. But he would be beat up and harassed every day. And he told us those stories about, not, not, not to freak us out, but to shake us and to educate us and to understand what it means to be Jewish in any part of the country and at any time in, in the world. Uh, and they taught me, my parents, I think most importantly that, and a lot of people may not agree with this, but they, their view of Judaism was that education was in fact above godliness, that it was most important to, le to learn, to read, to understand what it's like to be a member of the human race, and to do the best you can to take care of people, and to be kind, and to be generous at all times. And I think that's what, that's what I got out of my, my religion, and, and my parents' upbringing, I should say. You know, they did things like, in 1965, February 26th, 1965, and I remember that because that was my 15th birthday, they brought me in to see at Temple Israel of Hollywood, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King speak there uh, before a couple of really bad marches that led to the civil rights movement in spring of 1965, uh, getting a huge boost in the civil rights movement under President Lyndon Johnson. Anyway, it was remarkable. And they pushed that theory to listen to what other oppressed people have to say and learn from them and be kind to them and be part of their struggles. And that was a life-changing event to hear Dr. King speak for a 15-year-old boy. I want to say thank you. I, I've interviewed several people in this audience, two of them sitting right in front of me. Councilman, Councilwoman Gail Brewer, former Manhattan Borough President, and Dr. Ruth, great to see you. Amazing, both of you. So thank you for being here. All right, Bill, there are some people here who are going to be applying to college. Talk about your distinguished college career. Uh, my distinguished college career actually spans 40 years. Um, I, I, got, I was kicked out of San Diego State University uh, with one semester 
less than 15 units left to go. I was kicked out for anti-war activities in 1972. Um, and I sort of wore it as a, a badge of honor. I was against the war, very active against it. Went into reporting after that, but um, I, I never got my degree. One, four or five classes short of a degree. And I wore it as kind of badge of honor. And then when my oldest daughter, who was getting married next month, um, when my oldest daughter <clears throat> went to school, before the end of her freshman year, she said, why don't you go back to college? And so she and I kind of came up with this plan to have that happen. And <clears throat> uh, she graduated uh, three years later, and I graduated from the new school four years later with a degree, 44 years after I got kicked out. And it, I've thought of my parents, they're, they're both gone, I, I would have loved to, uh, for them to have been at that ceremony um, with Kathleen and the three kids, to say, hey, you know what, you're right. You know, you learn from things, and you learn that part of the religious training of Judaism, education is over godliness, you're never too old to learn. You're never too old to do something new. You're never too old to try something you might fail at. And uh, so they were with me. And I, I gave a little speech and, uh, and got my degree. And uh, that's my educational background. <laughs> but I'm, I'm quite proud of it. I'm quite proud of it. I want to say one more thing before we go on. Um, few people know this. I didn't know. that You didn't know I was Jewish. Um, you won't know this either. Uh, this July, early July, uh, Liz Cho and I celebrate 20 years together anchoring the 6 o'clock news, the, old, the longest running anchor team in the history of Channel 7. Um, but what you will not know is that we are the first Jewish anchor team in New York City history to be a permanent anchor. Oh, Liz Cho is Jewish? Who knew, you didn't know that. You didn't know I was Jewish. I, how many people knew Liz Cho was Jewish? One. So her mother was Jewish, her father was a, a Korean and a, a great uh, uh, physician for many, many years on, on uh, yeah, anyway, he's a very, very famous physician. Anyway, that's what, people, very few people know this, but that's why we don't go on uh, starting sundown Yom Kippur and uh, high holidays. What you may not know also is that Cardinal O'Connor's mother was Jewish. Cardinal O'Connor's mother was Jewish. That means the Cardinal of New York was a Jew. Keep that in mind as well. Uh, one more thing, well, you don't know this either. John Johnson, who remembers John Johnson for Channel yeah. 7, I would assume. One of the first really popular, active, you know, over the top celebrity kind of, of reporters who happened to be African American. We were, I was doing a story with him, I was doing a story involving him after, for the four, 40th anniversary of the assassination of John Lennon because we broke the story because one of our producers was in the uh, Roosevelt emergency room when they wheeled in John and he saw it. He was in an accident, he saw it and he saw he was dead. Called the desk, Howard Cosell broke it on Monday Night Football because we called in to our desk who called ABC. Um, that's not why I asked the call. Where was I going with this? Where was I going with this? John Johnson. So John was part of this. John was one of the guys who walked four blocks away and was, was dealing with this. So he shows me a picture. I'm interviewing him about this. He shows me a picture of his mother. That's your mother? Yeah, she's, she was German. Wait a minute, what? Wait, she was Jewish? Yes. Nobody knows that. John Johnson's mother was Jewish. So there are Jews everywhere. Only, only 15 million in the world. 15 million Jews in the world. If it hadn't been for the Holocaust, it might have been, the experts say maybe 35 million. But this is nothing. It is a, you know, what is it? How many, 13 million, 15 million. I mean, this is less than people in New York, all the state. A billion Catholics, a billion Muslims, 15 million Jews. It's just remarkable. Y'all know Rosanna Scotto? She's not Jewish. Not Jewish. She's Italian. <laughs> Bill, you're a person obviously with political views. How do you separate your politics from reporting a story? I don't involve my politics in, in reporting a story. That's how, that's how I avoid it. Um, but we do have beliefs and we do have feelings of what's right and wrong. We do know we won't talk about, we won't 
say things that are not true just because someone says they're not, they're, they're true, when we know they're not, we won't talk about that. You know, our job is to report the facts and search for the truth and bring that out no matter what. That is our, that is our goal. And I think that's what gets the most informed, critical thinking country. We were not ever, ever, ever taking it personally when we got trashed as the enemy of the people. Um, and I think that we held up pretty well on that. Uh, it was not easy. It was not easy. And we got, tried to get baited, but we wouldn't do that. We, we are going to report the facts and truth, and no matter where they fall, fall, and that's what I think the best job we can do is doing this. Bill, I want to present you with the Jewish Emmy Award, Class of 2023 Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was really a pleasure. So this is a, a closing song, an intro to our project of African-American Jewish, and I want to give it to George. Thank you. And to close us out, I'm delighted to introduce a board member of the Tin Pan Alley American Popular Music Project, also an arts educator in the Department of Education. And he will also be kicking off the Museum of the City of New York Centennial Weekend on October 13 with a program that he wrote and will be performing with African American cabaret star Natalie Douglas. So I give you Robert Lamont. Thank you. Thank you. What a, what a treat uh, and an honor to be here tonight with so many fabulous inductees, storied and stellar. Uh, and uh, stories is, is what it's all about. Here at uh, the Tin Pan Alley American Popular Music Project, we want to tell stories. What, what Dick Gottfried was saying earlier, this is important to tell the stories. And we have, um, we have a chance to tell stories for the next generation of Jewish and African American and, and other people that are going to be songwriters, producers, singers. And the song I'm going to perform for you now is a perfect example of that because Shelton Brooks uh, was, uh, he was actually Canadian uh, and half uh, indigenous as well. Uh, grew up on, uh, in Amherstburg, Canada, not far from where I grew up in Canada on a farm. I, I'm not Jewish and I'm not black and I thought, what can I do? Well, I'll do Shelton Brooks, he's Canadian. And uh, he went to Chicago and got his um, start as a songwriter. He was a ragtime pianist. He was an amazing performer as well as a writer. He's 24 years old. He goes to a Chicago theater and he meets Sophia Kalish, better known as Sophie Tucker. And Sophie, also 24 years old, she's, she's introduced to this young man by her maid, who was African American. So you have all this mix of, you've got to hear this guy, you've got to see this singer. And Shelton played this song for her that turned out to be her theme song for the rest of her life. It's called Some of These Days. Some of these days You're gonna miss me, honey Some of these days You'll feel so lonely You'll miss my hugging You'll miss my kissing. You'll miss me, honey, when you're far away. Now I feel so lonely when I feel for you only. For you know, honey, that you've had your way. And when you leave me, you know it will grieve me. You're gonna miss your red hot baby some of these days. Thank you very much. Go to Tin Pan Alley NYC and learn more about what we're doing. I'm on the education committee where uh, I taught 10 years in Manhattan public schools. 
we're, we're bringing education and, and learning, having, helping kids to learn all about Tin Pan Alley. Thank you so much for being a great audience. And as they say, and that's all, folks. So thanks for being here. <laughs>